All right, happy Easter, everyone. My name is James Morrow, uh, meteorologist here at the National Weather Service in Raleigh, and I'm joined today by uh, meteorologist Brandon Locklear, who's been working hard on the near-term forecast, which encompasses this very high impactful event that we're expecting here to unfold in the next 24 hours or so. Uh, Brandon, we're actually looking out the window now. We see some breaks in the uh, clouds and we got a little bit of a breeze going on, but things are certainly going to look a lot different here in about, what, eight to 12 hours. Yeah, yeah. We're really expecting a big change. Um, the um, overwhelming uh, trend in the guidance from what we've been seeing um, over the last 24 hours is, is just um, increasing our confidence that we are indeed going to, going to be in store for a um, widespread um, severe event for the area and, and potentially historical. Yeah, and just a reminder, this is a very, uh, it's going to unravel pretty quickly and things are going to change pretty rapidly as we go in the next uh, several hours uh, as we go into tonight and into tomorrow morning. Uh, so if you are tuning in later, visit weather.gov forward slash Raleigh for the latest weather information. This is decision support briefing number two for this event. And we have brand new information from the Storm Prediction Center, as you see in the mainly the top picture here that we'll go over. Um, but what has changed, we have issued a wind advisory um, and that is outside of the convection. So that is the winds ahead of and behind uh, the actual squall line that's gonna produce some of the severe weather. So uh, not only are we gonna have thunderstorm type impacts, we're gonna have some wind impacts before and after. And our confidence, as Brandon talked about, is growing that this is going to be a high impactful event here in Central North Carolina. So as we progress, Brandon, tell us a little bit about what you saw in the models today and, and what are some of the impacts that we're expecting? So yeah, you know, the first things that we're gonna start seeing is uh, this evening, uh, probably around eight and nine o'clock, we're gonna start seeing winds pick up. And there's a few gusts out there right now, um, but the overwhelming, um, signal is that probably between 4 and 5 a.m. Uh, we're really going to start seeing some strong winds to develop so before we yes we're going to see some showers and some rain and the triad has potential to see some intermittent moderate rain um, but before that squall line comes we're going to you're going to start hearing the wind start to pick up um, and the wind is going to basically start a couple hours ahead of that squall line and um, due to how strong the winds are just above the surface, uh, we're expecting to start seeing wind gusts between 30 and 35 to 40 miles per hour late overnight during the pre-dawn hours. And then those winds are going to probably peak between 6 a.m. and about 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. So, uh, we're, you know, a wind advisory means that you see frequent wind gusts um, basically over 40 miles an hour, and that's what we're expecting. Yeah, and, and one of the things about this event is we have just about every severe weather hazard in play. Um, There's a lot of inf information on this slide, but just keep in mind, um, most of the storm is going to be uh, capable of producing damaging wind gusts in the 60 to 70 mile per hour range, um, potentially and likely some strong to even violent long track tornadoes are possible. Um, that's a very, we don't use those words loosely. We very rarely put those in briefings, but that just goes to show you how highly impactful this event could be. Um, hail also is going to be a large concern here, up to golf ball size, and that's easily enough to damage any vehicles in motion and maybe even the siding of roofs and any outdoor plants and vegetation or animals that may be out there unprotected. Um, deadly cloud of ground lightning and even flash flooding, if there is a saving grace, with the flash flooding threat is these storms are gonna be moving quickly. Uh, so that should limit it, but any urban areas that may see a storm or two in a row, or we call it training storms, will have that possibility. And these threats are likely across the entire forecast area of Central North Carolina. Uh, so this is not something that we're gonna take like, likely here. Yeah, likely. yeah, and I think you could say that maybe a silver lining is the, the flash flooding threat has diminished um, and in fact, don't be surprised that if we have a burst of showers here over the next couple of hours, and then we'll, there's a good chance we might end up being mostly dry for, for the bulk of the overnight hours. So don't be surprised if you see that. Yeah, and here's a quick summary of some of the greatest impacts we just went over. We have a significant threat for tornadoes, damaging straight line winds, and hail 
along with lightning in this event. And flash flooding has been reduced a little bit to limited, but still that can be a significant threat in areas that see that prolonged period of rain like we just talked about. So now moving on, Brandon, tell us a little bit about the upgrade that they gave us today. And it's only a slight upgrade. And, and this is a confusing scenario where uh, you may have an enhanced risk this morning across the West, but because of when this storm is impacting, we really have two days worth of outlook. So we'll go over day one first. Uh, what do you expect before 6 a.m. tomorrow morning? Yes, yeah, so, you know, this. So day one takes us to 6 a.m. This is basically the time that the, most of the models bring that convective squall line into our area. And I would say that of everything that we were looking at, the timing is still the lowest confidence at this point. Um, this system is, is so strongly dynamically driven. The, the lift is incredibly strong and it's and you're talking about large scale lift. Those systems tend to race really fast eastward. At least that's been my experience. So the timing's still a little suspect, but um, you know, that day one, which ends at 6 a.m., that line should be just starting to come into into the triad um, right towards the end of the day one period. So that's why you see it kind of trailing off across the western part of the um, of the warning area there. Yeah, and I did make a mistake here. This actually ends at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. So I'll make sure to uh, fix that before we send it out. Um, but, you know, by early tomorrow, we're expecting that really organized line of storms to be just on our western board doorstep. And they can still have a lot of those hazards in play, even though it's an unusual time of day. And as we progress into Monday, so after 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, uh, that's when we're expecting the rest of the area to really be under the gun. And that's from those powerful, potentially long track tornadoes, damaging, damaging straight line wind gusts that will likely lock knock out power across much or at least a large portion of the region where the storms are strongest and some of that large hail. And if you look at some of the timing here, uh, should be exiting the triad region by about 9 a.m. Uh, with the triangle beginning to get under the gun anywhere from that mid morning time frame. So, um, you know, we have a wide range there, but really that 7 to 11 a.m. Um, time period is going to be when the central North Carolina is going to see most of its impact. And a little bit further east toward I-95, that's where you could potentially have storms lingering around till about the noon hour. But as you mentioned before, Brandon, they're going to be moving at a pretty fast clip. And, and, and keep in mind, in the meantime, we're still going to have strong gradient winds out ahead of the squall line. So you could see start seeing power outages well before uh, it starts raining or thundering outside. That's right. So taking another look at the timing using some radar simulations, um, we are expecting to have some showers lingering today. So right around now, we may have some showers now exiting parts of the triad region. Uh, we should expect that to kind of uh, increase in coverage over the next few hours before it actually backs off again. So uh, just because you may see rain at 8 or 9 o'clock, that doesn't mean the main part of the system's here. That's actually uh, associated with the warm front that's moving north, and that's not going to be the most highly impactful event. Uh, but as we get into tomorrow morning, we're going to start to see more storm coverage um, from the west, and that 8 a.m., to 12 p.m. time frame is really when, uh, or slightly before that, is really when those strongest severe storms with all of those hazards are going to enter into our area. And that is the time that we're most concerned about. And it's a rather unusual time of day to see some of those hazards here in Central North Carolina. Uh, so we talked a little bit about the wind advisory. <coughs> Excuse me. That goes from 4 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning, that's Monday morning, to 4 p.m. And that is for the uh, non uh, thunderstorm related winds. So the thunderstorms, like we said, have the potential for 60 to 70 mile an hour wind gusts with the strongest storms. Uh, this is actually not associated and it's going to cause some power outages even ahead of the main line of storms. As we talked about some sustained winds from the south, 20 to 30 with gusts in the 45, 50 mile an hour range uh, during that time period. Uh, and Brandon, maybe you could talk a little bit about this, but uh, you know, we talked a little bit or brought it up uh, this is an unusual time for some of these uh, for some of these impacts that we normally see in the afternoon hours. So, uh, but this isn't something we this is something we've seen before, and unfortunately, can have some dangerous consequences. Yeah. So, uh, if you if you lived in North Carolina long enough, you know that most of our severe weather occurs basically between two o'clock in the afternoon to about seven or eight o'clock in the evening during the daylight hours. Um, it's 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 kind of rare to have um, severe weather that that lasts uh, all night, um, but in case of tornadoes, our fatalities are highest 
at night and it makes sense because people are asleep. They're not weather aware. So I think, you know, especially for places west of, of US-1, uh, if you live in those counties, this is the message to be, to be sending out to folks is tonight people really need to be paying attention. Um, um, if they have uh, nor weather radio, uh, make sure you have batteries in that and that's working properly or whatever means in which you receive your warnings. Um, I mean, if we're issuing tornado warnings, the WEA on your cell phones are going to be going off. So you may want to leave those plugged on or the volume turned up. So um, yeah, the nighttime tornadoes are the ones, even though uh, they make up a small portion of when tornadoes occur, they actually have the highest fatalities associated with them. Yeah, and as we all sit down for Easter dinner tonight, this is a great time to discuss with your family, where do we go? You know, especially if it's 6 a.m. before any of us wake up, where is the location in our house that is most safe if a tornado warning or a tornado watch is issued? And a watch means the ingredients are there, um, but a warning means that that is a pending, uh, you know, the, the tornado is either occurring or will occur momentarily. So you wanna take action anytime we upgrade to a warning. And anytime we are under a tornado watch or tornado warning, you wanna make sure you have some basic supplies in place. We talked about a way to get notified, but in your safe place, which is usually a downstairs interior room in a stable structure, uh, you wanna have a lot of supplies like helmets, pillows, or even a mattress that can protect you and your family from anything falling or flying uh, through the windows or, or the doors. Uh, also shoes to protect your feet from a broken glass a whistle or noise making device just in case you and your family get trapped in a structure, um, anything for your children that may be necessary for a long period of time, and just have your pet carriers, leashes, and other pet supplies handy uh, because you don't want to forget about your furry friends. Um, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, have multiple ways to get that warning. Don't rely on just one thing. Um, have uh, other sources like your local TV and radio station apps. Uh, wireless, wireless emergency alerts on your cell phone, but make sure that cell phone is charged. Uh, outdoor sirens, which we don't have a ton of those here in North Carolina, but if you do live near them, react when you hear them. Don't go out to see what's going on. Actually get into shelter and other weather apps that may be available out there. And just keep good tornado sheltering guidelines uh, in mind and have a safe place to go. If you don't live in a very tornado safe structure, find another structure to use as soon as that tornado watch is issued because it's going to take some time to get to that safe place. And you have some really good options um, that you can see down there. So just kind of going over some of the, the ending uh, points here, um, the confidence for this event is high. Uh, we expect the period of greatest impact to be after midnight tonight and persist into Monday morning uh, with the greatest impacts, especially across central North Carolina being right around dawn uh, maybe an hour or so before through about the noon hour. And that's when we're expecting most of these impacts uh, to occur. And these impacts can include uh, wind gusts 60 to 70 miles per hour, several tornadoes possible, um, one of two of which may become violent with long tracks. So they could track for the majority of our forecast area. Or we've had you know cases in the past that have tracked numerous counties um, and into different states. So, um, you know, this is certainly a scenario where that something like that can happen. Yeah, I want to break in right here. Jamie, let's go back to the um, the simulated ra radar reflectivities. I want to I touch on something. So tomorrow morning or tonight when you wake up, something to watch out for, and we're going to be certainly watching out for, and we're trying to diagnose that right now, is when you start seeing the we think it's going to be a line of convection. When you start seeing that starting to move east into our area, you're going to want to closely watch the structure of that convection as it pushes eastward uh, through the pre-dawn hours and uh, until until around noon. If you see that that is more of a solid, what we call, call a convective line segment or a bow segment, bow segment, um, we're probably going to be dealing with mostly a widespread thunderstorm wind damage uh, with some isolated uh, tornadoes. But if you start seeing structure, and this is kind of indicating it, and we're seeing some other models trying to indicate it, where there's there, the lines breaking up and you're starting to see what we call discrete thunderstorms and supercells, um, then we're looking at more of a tornado threat. So watch out for that um, tomorrow again, you know, we're seeing a, we're seeing mixed signals. It could go either way at this point. 
Uh, but we are maybe seeing a, a slight more trend that it could be a more of a uh, what we call a discrete supercell uh, line as it comes through. So uh, watch that, and that's and that's going to be a big telltale if we're dealing with more wind or more tornadoes. And a lot of times the discrete cells can also play into favor for large hail too. So yes. we have multiple threats that are in play, and uh, this is just going to be a very high impactful event. And uh, one that we want to really try to press home, don't let it catch you off guard. Make sure those plans are in place tonight. That way, if you are woken up with a warning tomorrow, you'll know exactly what to do and how to respond to that. Um, and then, of course, dangerous cloud to ground lightning will be um, possible and flash flooding is also possible, especially in urbanized areas. At this point, I'm going to uh, uh, pause the presentation and we'd be happy to take any questions. Just go ahead and jot them down in your questions box.